Now, usually I'm a fan of car designers and companies trying new things, coming up with new exciting design solutions. But sometimes these turn into trends that are not as exciting. So in this video, I want to talk about my top five car design trends that needs to stop for 2021. The number one trend that needs to be stopped are all the fake vents on all of the cars. Doesn't even matter if it's a performance car anymore. This trend pops up at your soccer mom Chevy Equinox. For example, just have a look at this Honda Civic Type R here with the two massive black spots in the front on each side. And as you sure know, these are not vents. These are just black plastic pieces. It doesn't get any better if you look at the rear either, which is pretty much a mirror of the front end graphics. At least in the rear, they try to make it look like vents by adding some mesh textures on to the plastic. And this trend stretches over all kinds of cars, such as the BMW X6, which we're gonna come back to later in this video. I have a lot more to say about that car. The Equinox, as I said before. And now this is a special one. Just have a look at the grill, the front end grill of the Ford Mustang GT 350R here. And you can just see what tiny portions of the entire grill in the front is actually used to cool the car. It's just this tiny rectangle that's actually doing anything. But the king of fake vents in 2020 is the Toyota Supra. It would have looked so much better if they just removed all of these fake vents or at least tried to make some of them functional. And the reason this trend is so weird to me is it just doesn't make sense. There's no need anymore for massive cooling in the front because the radiators are so much more effective than they were, say, 20, 25 years ago. And on top of that, we're moving towards a, an age of electrification of cars where the combustion engine isn't a piece of the, the whole car that needs to be cooled. Instead, the car runs on a platform of batteries. So in the, in the future, a lot of the cars are going to look just like the Tesla Model, Model S and the Model 3 and the Model X, I guess, as well, with just a solid front end without a lot of grills and stuff openings in the front end. So that's why it's kind of weird to me that even though we're in at the end of the combustion engine era, the grills just keeps getting larger and larger for no apparent reason. I do understand that if they were to use it for identity and styling and ruggedness, those are the three kind of categories where I can see using some plastic parts in the front would actually make sense. But that is just a small percentage of car companies today. So what does the Chevy Corvette, the Ferrari LaFerrari, the Lotus Evora, and the Porsche 918 Spyder all have in common? They all have different size wheels front and back. And to me, this trend is most noticeable on the new 2021 BMW M3. Just look at this picture here and bounce your eyes back and forth bet between the, the rear wheel and the front wheel and you're gonna see the difference here and how big of an impact it actually makes when you know about this thing. Now I obviously have to go in and fix this real quick. Nice. This is a trend that just recently started to find its way to modern sports cars and it's purely for aesthetic purposes. I know some of you are going to argue it will increase grip and overall performance of the car. However, the rim size itself has nothing to do with that. What matters in is the width of the rear tire. The more powerful the car, the wider the rear tire needs to be in order to translate that power into grip. And this is of course for rear wheel drive cars. And I'm not a huge fan of this trend. It bugs me when I see the diameter of the rear being bigger than the front wheel. And unless you're aware of it, it's you might not even notice this thing, but when you are aware of it, it becomes very noticeable. The reason for it is to create a better looking stance for the car, specifically if you look at it in a side view, it kind of has this leaning forward, ready to, to pounce stance, but to me, it makes it look like a hot wheel car. And I always want to go in and increase the front wheel diameter to fit the rear and retain the balance of the ge geometric shapes and the graphics of the car when you look at it in side view. I 
don't talk about interiors a lot here on this channel, but this is a trend that I hope they will become better at doing or implementing. We, we, we're talking about the floating iPads that you have inside of cars. The problem I have with this is that it literally looks like someone just took an iPad, just glued it onto the dash of whatever car we're talking about. It doesn't have any integration in the rest of the car. And the problem that, that I know this is, is because the rest of the interior usually is very organic, very curvy, and then you need to have this square looking screen fit inside of that dash. So what most car companies decided to do was just, we're just not even gonna try and implement it beautifully in the dash. Instead, we're just gonna have it be floating on top of the dash and call it a day. Now, some companies do this pretty well, such as Tesla with the Model S and the X, and some do it worse, like the new Venza from Toyota, where it just looks like it's about to fall off the top of the dash. I think in the future, we're going to have interactive windows, so you actually see the information almost as a head-up display all around the car. That would be pretty cool to see. Overall, I have yet to see a beautiful integration of this device, which is the center screen onto the dash in any car, except for maybe Rolls-Royce Phantom, where you can hide it so you can rotate it and hide it completely, just like with the flying lady on top of the grill. Trend number four is something that I really haven't heard anyone talk about. So either I'm going nuts or it hasn't been brought to your attention just yet. And the trend I'm talking about is what I call diffuser islands. So what exactly is a diffuser island? Well, it's the little piece in the lower part of the diffuser that has no connection at all to the rest of the colored body bodywork of the car. It makes the rear end look cheaper and more importantly, it makes it look taller than what it actually needs to be visually. And this is especially annoying when they appear, appear on sports cars and even exotics. What it does visually and graphically is drag the bottom down to the ground and create unnecessary sagginess in the rear. Instead of a firm and tight rear end, this little splash of color in the lower part of the car ruins the overall impression of it. The reason is because it's not connected, as I said, to the rest of the painted body panels of the car. It's like a lonely little island sitting down there alone without any sort of connection to the mainland. Trend number five is the last, but definitely not the least trend that I hope will disappear soon. I'm sure it will not, but you can always wish for something like this to happen. And this is the so-called SUV coupes. I mean, what is the point with these cars? Why would you buy a coupe on stilts? Not only that, but why is it now normal to call four-door sedans with a bit of a sloping or curvature on the roof line? Why do we call these coupes? If you want a coupe, you buy a coupe, meaning a sleek, beautiful, low-riding two-door vehicle. If you want an SUV, you buy an SUV, a sports utility vehicle with all the space you need for the family and whatever luggage you need to carry with you. The SUV coupes exist for one single reason, poser status. They will go off-road just as many times as they will go to the track, which is obviously never. It's a blend of two opposite philosophies that separately are great. You have the off-roads and then you have the coupes, but together they become completely useless. The only SUVs coupes I think they can kind of get away with the shape are the Porsche Cayenne coupe. And that is only because it has this relationship to the Porsche 911 since way back and it kind of translates well into an SUV form, but I'm still not a fan. And then you have the BMW X6, which wins the overall trend of just re remove the X6 for 2021, because not only is it an extremely unattractive SUV coupe, it also has a diffuser island, and on top of that, they just slammed the body with a bunch of fake vents. 
In all of these SUV coupe uh, cases, I would always choose the normal SUV of whatever model we're talking about. For example, the Audi Q5 or Q3 Sportback. Why would you choose this instead of the beautiful normal SUV Q5 or Q3? Same goes for the GLE. The GLE or the GLC as well, they're one of the best looking SUVs, but they completely ruin the shape when they turn it into coupe versions of the SUV versions. So I would always choose the regular SUV version of the model, not just because they always look a thousand times better than the coupe versions, but mostly because I'm not an idiot. Now I have to throw in a bonus trend here, which is very specific, of course, for BMW. So I want to talk about the grills of BMW here. Don't let your kids watch it. I'm not sure what they're trying to do here. If they're just going nuts, experimenting with these massive nostril grills or teeth or whatever they're called now, they're definitely not nostrils anymore because they're way too big for that. Just look at the M3 and the M4, which by the way, I think the M3 looks a lot better than the M4 with this front fascia. I've tried adding this grill onto the BMW X5 and even went back to the M3 E46 and added these crazy big grills on top of that, but it never seems to work out. And then you have the BMW iX, which is, you know, fundamentally ugly. It lacks the, the fundamentals of what beauty is. And to me, that all comes from nature and lines of flow. And this car just lacks any sort of, it's like the opposite of that. For the new BMW and M3 and M4, I think we can possibly save the M3. It will maybe look good in real life, but the M4, I'm not sure how exactly we could save that car.